This book uh, is like a, uh, like a mine shaft that you go into with your interpretive spade and start digging away at the, the nuggets there that you find. And you, you will never get to the bottom of the rich veins that are in that particular mine shaft of the Word of God. Uh, St. Augustine, one of the great theologians of the church age at the beginning, uh, was convicted of sin, trusted Christ as his Savior when he read Romans 13. Uh, Martin Luther uh, came to know Christ as Savior when... Uh, the essence of the gospel impacted him from Romans 1.17, where he talks about uh, the righteous man shall live by faith. He thought the righteous man should live by works, but he got saved based on that one verse. John Calvin, great uh, reformationist as well, was impacted by this book, as was John Wesley, the father of Methodism. Uh, he heard a, uh, someone reading the, the lectures from Luther, just the preface to the epistle of, the, of Romans and got saved based on that. And so the book has had a profound impact. John Bunyan uh, wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I, have you read it? You've read it? Uh, I, I had an aunt give it to me when I graduated from high school. She gave me screw tape letters when I was 18 and John Bunyan uh, uh, what, a, what a great book, Pilgrim's Progress, which is all based on the metaphor of what happens when a person comes to know God, and then what happens them in their walk with God, and that's what that great book is about, based on the motif of Romans. Uh, when I became a believer in 1967, I was nine years old, uh, the pastor gave all new converts a little packet. Uh, remember mimeograph machines? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I do, when you go in the church office, you'd hear this clank, 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 and stuff spitting out the other end. It was before there was electricity, you, know, you understand. But, uh, but I, they'd crank them out, these little packets, and they, they had to fold them multiple times in the office. And I still have my little packet of uh, verses, they said, as new, new converts should memorize these verses. Uh, and so I did, and I will not forget them. And I can tell you all of them. But uh, it was basically the Roman road, and it started in Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is sinless. We all come into the world that way. And as I've said before, if you don't believe in sin, just have a child and you'll understand <laughs> sin. Uh, uh, Romans 6.23. For the wages of being, the payment for being a sinner is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Boy, those are important prepositions as we'll see because we're going to study grammar as well. Isn't it exhilarating? Uh, and isn't it exhilarating? You, you don't sound convinced yet. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get into all that when we get into the book. Uh, how about Romans 10, 9? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God is raised from, from the dead, you might be saved. No, it doesn't say that. Yeah, it says you, yeah, you shall be. You will be saved at the moment. Yeah. How about uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2? Are you cheating and looking forward? I'm hearing pages turning. You're cheating? This is church. You shouldn't cheat. Yeah. That's where he talks about, you know, you know, my brethren, you know, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That, in the renewing of your mind, etc. Uh, wow, great verses. Uh, it impacted me. I, I was so intrigued with uh, the book of Romans when I got into uh, college at Azusa Pacific University uh, in 76. Um, I took my first uh, inter uh, beginning Greek class because I wanted to read the original text. And then I took uh, uh, an intermediate Greek. And then I took my senior year advanced Greek. And advanced Greek in college was an exegesis of the book of Romans. And the, the professor assigned you passages that you had to exegete. Uh, and he gave me Romans 5, 12 to 21. Uh, I have never forgotten the work I put into that paper. And it has revolutionized my understanding of the gospel and its power. And where did sin come from? And what's the answer to sin? It's all in the heart of that whole argument. That was in a Greek class in college when I was, you know, a young man. And then when I went to grad school at a Dallas Theological Seminary, and I was a Greek major before I was a Hebrew major, um, I took four more years of Greek, so I took six. And on my sixth year of Greek uh, in grad school, uh, I took Exegesis of Romans from Dr. Harold Honer, who was uh, educated, I think, at Oxford. Uh, and before God took that great man and got home, he was one of the leading authorities on biblical chronology. He wrote a book called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. So if you ever want to validate biblical dating in the New Testament and the actual date of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, which is verified, uh, that's the book to read. Uh, so this book has impacted me over the years, and I've never ceased to be amazed at 
there's always so much more to find as you go down into that mind shelf. So I invite you to come with me. Uh, Dr. D. Edbert, uh, Edmund Hebert uh, says concerning the book of uh, Romans, says this epistle is acknowledged to be one of the most profound books in existence. Its impressive grandeur, its impenetrable depths make it one of the most highly prized parts of Holy Scripture. It says it has very appropriately been termed the cathedral of the Christian faith. He said, it is not without adequate reason that this matchless epistle was assigned to its first position among the Pauline writings in our New Testament canon. He says it forms one of the major bulwarks of evangelical Christianity, and indeed it does. And in my estimation, it is exactly what our carnal culture needs to hear. The glory and power of the cross of Christ and the empty tomb, the resurrection. If anyone needs to hear the power of the gospel to transform a life and a nation and a world, uh, it's the world in which we live. And so I'm looking forward to being challenged and stretched as God will speak. And I'm looking for him to do that to our church and, and in your life to help grow you into his image. And if you don't know him as, as, as your savior and your Lord, uh, he's going to take a jackhammer and put it onto your soul, the hardened unbelief of your soul. And he's going to get your attention as only God can do because he loves you. And he wants to show you the reasons to come to him and, and have a faith relationship with him based on the evidences of the resurrection. So based on all that, we want to jump into the book. And this is not your normal sermon. I'm not getting into verse 1 until uh, next week. And we'll be in verse 1, the first part of it, for one week, one verse. We're going to move quickly. <laughs> I'm no prophet or son of a prophet, but I, I think that's the speed we'll go. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move along quicker as we go along. But uh, we want to first look at some background information before we study the book. Maybe you're a new Christian. You've never studied it. Don't know that much about it. Uh, we want to go back through the, the book and just ask foundational questions. That's all we're going to do today. So first thing we're going to do uh, as we look at this Roman road behind me, uh, we want to look at first, who's the author of the book? That's pretty simple. Because if you go to Romans one verse one that we're going to spend an entire Sunday on. How could you talk for an entire Sunday on that verse? It's not a problem. What does it say? Paul. Paul. That's a sermon right there. Paul. That's a 10 part series right there. Who is he? He's a bond servant of Christ Jesus called as an apostle and then set apart for the gospel of God. That's a, that's at least a 10 month series right there. Um, Paul the Apostle, he's the author of the book of Romans, and what a man of, of, of God he became and was, uh, but he didn't start out that way, because his, his name before he was, Paul was Saul, Saul. Uh, so if you're playing Bible trivia, this could be a, a question you're going to want to know, what was Paul's name before he was? Paul. It was Paul, it was Saul, yeah, you, it's Saul, yeah, 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 Saul was his pre-Christian name, Paul was his Christian name. Now, where did, the, where did his parents, the good Jewish family that he came from, where did, where did they get this uh, Saul concept from? Well, another trivia question. The game's hanging on you knowing the answer to this. Where did Paul's name probably come from? First king of Israel, Saul. Saul. Uh, that's where his name probably came from. And uh, that was his pre-Christian uh, upbringing. He's uh, trained by uh, the Pharisee scholar uh, Gamaliel, one of the famous rabbis. Uh, and he learned under him. Because we learn about Paul's life in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. He's the author of Romans. Notice what he says about himself. Nationality, ethnicity, what is he? I'm a Jew. He'll tell you right up front. Uh, what are you? I'm, I'm Jewish. Uh, where were you born? Tarsus, Tarsus uh, in, of Cilicia. Uh, next logical question, where's that? Well, if you go to Syria and you go north and you kind of hang a left as you're heading into Turkey, uh, you run into Cilicia, Tarsus, where he was from. Uh, brought up uh, in, 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 in this uh, city, educated under Professor Gamaliel, uh, strictly according to what? To the law. What law? What law? Jewish law, which would be Mosaic law, which would be... The first five books of the Old Testament, Penta meaning five in Greek, Tuk meaning law, first five books of the Old Testament, tor Tyrannic law. He knew that well. So there was uh, how many of the big commandments? Ten. Ten. And how many additional commandments were there in 613? He said, uh, yeah, I was trained in that. I know it. I was trained in a law strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God just as you are all today. He was, he was a student for probably five to six years under Gamaliel, uh, getting his, I guess you could say, his version of a PhD in, 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 uh, in uh, Torah studies, uh, a great thinker. He would have learned from Gamaliel how to think, how to debate, how to deconstruct arguments, how to present your argument. Um, 
well read when you read Paul, especially as you look at his life in the book of Acts. Uh, he read his opponent's literature, could quote uh, Greek philosophers, etc., because he read what the opponents had to say to be able to properly evaluate it. Uh, he, was a, he was a force to be reckoned with. Plus, he was multi, multilingual. Uh, he was a very gifted man. But he was under the assumption that a man is saved, gets into heaven, as it were, based on two things. You got to believe in God, and you got to do works to stay saved. That's what he thought. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, we're still talking about Paul, the author of the book of Romans, in case I lost you. We're in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Notice what he says about himself. He says, uh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone, notice the conditional clause there, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh as far as getting to heaven based on how you perform, I far more, I beat you on performance. Uh, he tells you, let me give you my uh, my. Uh, evidence why I was at the top of the line for getting into heaven based on my er erroneous form of religious viewpoint. Uh, first of all, I was a Jew. Uh, he's thinking all Jews go to heaven. And then he says, I was circumcised the eighth day. Uh, I was from the nation of Israel. Oh, and I, I was from the tribe of Benjamin. And just as a side note, if you read the Old Testament, uh, the Benjamites were basically left-handed. It's true. It's another trivia question. They were le I'm left-handed. Darren's left-handed. Devout people are left-handed. I'm just saying, but... <laughs> Uh, they were the slingers in Israel. Uh, they, were, they were like the mortar division. They were left-handed and all had to deal with defense and offense and military setting. But um, he said, I'm, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, and as far as, as a Hebrew, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm like the tip of the spear. If you look up Hebrew in a dictionary, uh, you're going to come down to, to the, you know, the definition. There's my picture. Um, as to the law of Moses, uh, yeah, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, like how zealous was I as a student of the law? I, I had total zeal. Uh, so much so, he says, I was a persecutor of the ecclesia, the church. You know the one when the Jews would leave Judaism and embrace belief in this Jesus character that we executed on Golgotha, and they would trade their Judaism, multi-generations of Jews, and go embrace him as the Messiah because they said he was resurrected. I killed them. He's devoted to his concept of his religion. He would verbally debate you and physically remove you. How would you like Paul knocking on your door if you were a Christian, a Jew who had left the faith as it were? See, he was under the assumption that, I told you by way of review, because review is a wonderful thing, isn't it? You get into heaven how? You got to believe in God. Okay. And you got to do the works of the law. The works of the law combined with faith get you into heaven. You know how many erroneous religious systems believe that same premise? Many. Um, and he, he's going to find out that uh, God had other plans for him. Because on one of his missions to go eliminate more Christians, Jews who left Christ Judaism and embraced Christ, the, the Messiah. And by the way, how could you get Jews that are multi-generational Jewish people to leave their Judaism and embrace Jesus as the Messiah? Because he really did rise from the grave. They had living evidence. They could go walk and talk to people and evaluate the evidence to determine whether he truly did resurrect or not. But that's a whole other discussion we'll save for Easter. Uh, but they got saved. And he's on his way to Damascus to get rid of more Christians who would believe in the Messiah, Jesus. And we know from Acts chapter 8, verse 9, after he, he was stood there and held everybody's cloaks while they executed Stephen for defecting over to Christianity, uh, he approved of the stoning of Stephen. Now he's on his way uh, to get rid of more Christians. And God, well, he has an encounter. You know, the jackhammer experience where God says, Paul, I need to get your attention. I need to rattle your cage. You know, you, you've read Acts, I'm sure, and he's on his road to Damascus in broad daylight, you know, cloudless day, and all of a sudden there's a blinding light from heaven that stops him dead in his tracks, and he can't see because of the blinding nature of the light, and all of a sudden from heaven comes the voice of Christ, who he thought was quite dead, and he asked him a really simple question. Do you remember what he asked him? He calls his name how many times? Twice. Saul, Saul. I like the King James. Why do you kick against the goads? What are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? Well, Lord, I, <laughs> you're alive. See, his life was changed that day. He became a believer that day. His life was radically changed. Uh, he took the zeal that he had for the law in a false erroneous system of salvation by works, and he trades it for salvation by faith in the living Messiah. He became a believer that day because he saw the light, as it were, literally. 
How did that impact him in the rest of his life? Well, it changed him dramatically. Uh, because uh, when you look at the New Testament, and how many books are, <clears throat> are in the New Testament, by the way? Well, here's a way to remember. If you take the word new, three letters, and you take the word testament, nine, nine times three is 27. That's how many books are in the Old Test- in the New Testament. The Old Testament is three, plus testament is nine. It's 39 are in the Old Testament, or 66 total. But it's just a trivia question. So <laughs> I'm just saying. So out of those, uh, those, how many books are in the New Testament? 27, 27. Uh, 13 are his, his epistles. He was busy writing. Why? When he got saved, he took that zeal for the erroneous view of religion and took that zeal with the true form of religion and wrote prolifically about it. Like what kind of books? Well, what did he write? Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. I mean, he wrote much of the New Testament about his faith. And, and he taught everywhere. Wherever he went, everywhere he went, he was, he was talking about Jesus. That zeal. You, you got to back, and this is, you know, when someone gets saved and they're all excited about their faith, they want to go talk about it. What, what does some older Christian say? Well, that'll die down after a while. And they'll be mature like we are. Quiet. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this before. You know, like when you get saved, you want to tell people, right? Did, did you? I did. 1967. I got saved on a Sunday. Monday was the first day of class. First week of September. I got saved. What do you friends ask you in the lunchroom after all, you've not seen each other all summer? What would you do all summer? You know? I, said, I can remember sitting at the lunchroom with my tray of whatever it was. And, and my friends asked me, oh, how was your summer? I got saved yesterday. Huh? And I began to talk to him. I never stopped talking to him. Because when, when God saves you, when you see the light of the glory of the gospel, it changes you where you want to either write about it, talk about it, or do both. One of my friends, Craig Bischke, uh, we debated all through junior high, high school. I went to college. He went to, he became a submariner in the Navy. I didn't see him since uh, 1975. Uh, in the early 90s, he found me and called me one day. I was in my garage and I picked up the phone. And he goes, do you know who this is? I, no, I don't know this voice. It's from your past. I still don't know who it is. <laughs> that really helps, you know. He goes, it's Craig. I go, oh, Craig the atheist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh so why are you calling me? Because I remember many debates in Craig's bedroom. You know, I, this would probably date me, but his room was the bedroom with the beads hanging in the hallway. In the, you know what I'm and then he had the black light posters, you know, black lights, all, you know, and the lava lamp, you know, and the Jimi Hendrix on the 78. Yeah, and you turn the, yeah. You always take Jimi Hendrix and put him on 45 speed. It sounded really cool. But anyway, um, incense burning. I mean, this is, the, you know, it was the world back then. And he called me to tell me, you know, all those debates we had about Christ and, and atheism and everything, and I was a devout atheist. He said, when you went to Bible school and I went to the U.S. Navy, became a submariner, he said, you always challenged me to read the Bible. I never did. And uh, he said, when I was under the water and, and was not on my shift, uh, somebody gave me a Bible, so I sat in my bunk and I read it, and I got saved in a sub. <laughs> saved in a sub. <laughs> saved in a sub. It happens. He got saved in his sub, you know, hundreds of feet under the water, and uh, he said, I'm calling to tell you that I came to know Christ, and I'm now a deacon in my church, and I use, and I use my guitar to, to lead prisoners in worship of Christ at a local jail. <laughs> I, I could almost cry on the phone. Saved. See, that was Paul. Paul got saved, and he talked about it, which leads to a logical question, do you talk about it? See, Paul's talking about it. Uh, he wrote a whole book about salvation. Uh, where did he write the book from? Uh, he wrote it from Corinth. That's where he wrote the book. Uh, how do we know that? Uh, Romans chapter 1, thinking minds want to know, don't they? Where was he? He was in Corinth, uh, in Greece. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 10. Notice what he says to these people. He says, always in my prayers, making request, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I might succeed in coming to you. Has he seen them? No. no. Did Paul found the church in Rome? Nope. He had never seen them. He said, I've always wanted to go to Rome, but I've never, you know, I've never quite been able to get on American Airlines and fly there. You know, just, God never let me go there. I, I really would like to come there, but I'm going to send you this letter prior to me coming, but I'm going to share with you doctrine, but I've, I've not been to your church. Notice what he says in Romans 15 at the end of the book. And Romans 15, what is this? This is 2017. So probably 20, I don't know, 2028 or 29. We'll get to chapter 15, <laughs> verse 22. He says, for this reason, I have often been prevented from coming uh, to you, but now with no further place for me in these regions, because uh, he had all been all through Asia Minor, 
preaching the gospel. And since I've had for many years a longing to come to you, to, you know, to, to Rome. And he says, whenever I go to Spain, uh, uh, I'd like to stop by Rome. Uh, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. I'd love to come to Rome. I've never been there. But I'd love to come there. Where was he? Well, he was on one of his missionary journeys. How many journeys did he take? Three. Three main ones. And which journey was he on? Well, it wasn't the first one and it wasn't the second one. It had to be the third one. How do we know that? Romans 15, verse 25. Notice what he says. It says, but now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. The main church of the, the planet, all the churches was from Jerusalem. Uh, for Macedonia, north of Greece, uh, Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So the Jerusalem church was poor. Some of the other churches, like the ones in Greece, were wealthy. And he said, I've been going around that region on my third missionary journey, collecting monies for the church in Jerusalem. Uh, he's writing his epistles, like 1 Corinthians, he wrote it in Ephesus around 56 AD. He was there for three years. He wrote it, and then he begins to travel throughout uh, the region of Macedonia to collect monies for the church in the third missionary journey. And as he's heading toward uh, Athens and Corinth, uh, he's telling the, the Corinthians, I'm bringing Macedonians with me, uh, and we've collected monies for the church in Jerusalem, and we want you to give to help support the mother church as well. He could have only have said he's in Macedonia on his third missionary journey. So when did, he, when did he write the, the book of Romans? Probably around 56 to 57 AD, uh, based on a chart that I put together for you, around, you know, kind of May-ish of 57. Um, and he's, uh, he's telling you, uh, uh, I'm in the Corinthian area when I'm writing this particular document. Um, in Romans chapter 16, uh, verse 23, he mentions Gaius uh, as his host. Uh, Gaius is probably the Gaius of 1 Corinthians 1.14, which tells you Paul was in Corinth because he's talking about Gaius. Um, Romans chapter 15, verse 19, uh, he makes this statement. He says, uh, in the power of signs and wonders and in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem around about, as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Illyricum, where was that? Uh, well, that was uh, just across the, the sea. I think it was the Adriatic Sea from Italy going east. And that whole coastline uh, was uh, Illyricum, which was just next to Macedonia, which was just north of uh, Corinth. He's, he could not have made that statement at the end of Romans unless he had been on his third missionary journey and had been in Corinth as, as notified. Chapter 16, verse 1. A sermon's kind of like an, uh, an attorney arguing a point, is it not? It's a validation of the evidence. Where was he? He's in Corinth. Uh, chapter 16, verse 1. Notice what he says. I commend your sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is, where was the church? Was she at? Cancria. Uh, uh, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and that you help her in whatever she, matter she may need of you for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. So Phoebe's coming to the, the church in Rome but where's she from? Cancria. Yeah, where's, where's that at? Well, that's right near Corinth. Why was he saying he was with Phoebe? Because he's in Corinth. He's in that region writing to the church in Rome. Uh, what is so significant about that in relationship to the book of Romans? Well, if you know the first chapter of Romans where he talks about sexual debauchery in Romans, because it was uh, sexual promiscuity was going off the grid in, the, in Rome, he's seeing it in Corinth. Here's a picture from uh, Corinth. Uh, it's a, a Roman uh, street on the left, what's left of it, and some of the buildings. And from uh, the city of Corinth where he planted the Corinthian church, um, you could look up from the city, uh, Paul could at any given day and see the Acro-Corinthian Hill, 1,886 feet rising straight up from the floor of the, of the surrounding land. And on top of that was the Temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and love. And the way you worshipped her was there were, there were a thousand male and female temple prostitutes to help you in worship. You could go up there in the daytime for worship, and in the evening they would come down to the city and help people worship. Talk about perversion. Just when you think sin and sexual sin can go no deeper, it went very deep in the city of Corinth. And Paul says, I was in Corinth writing the letter to the Romans. And what I'm writing about in chapter one, I'm seeing in Corinth. Why is he doing this? Well, he's like, if Corinth needs the gospel of Christ to free people from sexual sin, I know Rome does. Where was he? What city was he in? Corinth. Corinth. Uh, who are the people of the book that he wrote to? Well, it's written to the Romans. Who were they? Well, uh, we want to know who they are. Um, this is very interesting. Donald uh, Guthrie, New Testament scholar, writes this about who he wrote to. He says, it's almost certain that no apostle found the church in Rome. No apostle. It wasn't Peter. He didn't found the church. And it wasn't Paul. 
It says, uh, Paul claims in Romans 15, 20, that he did not build on another man's foundation, yet he seems to regard the Roman church as within his sphere of his own commission. So that he says the claim that Peter founded it, the church in Rome, is brought under serious suspicion by the fact that Peter was still in Jerusalem at the time of the Jerusalem Council in AD 50. Whereas it is almost certain that the church exists in Rome prior to that. Suetonius, the Roman historian, uh, um, wrote some about 70 to 80 years after uh, the fact, records that Claudius, the ruler, banished Jews from Rome in 49 AD. Why? He says because there was rioting at the instigation by one called Crestus. Who's Crestus? Why were the Jews rioting in 49 AD in the Roman environment over Crestus? Who's Crestus? Well, F.F. F. Bruce, the great New Testament scholar, uh, identifies uh, Crestus as the Latin uh, derivation of Christos, Christ. What happened? Jews got saved, left Judaism like Paul, began to tell their Jewish family members, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, they now knew the risen Messiah, the Messiah Jesus. And their family needed to know the risen Savior. That started riots. Riots. So much so that Claudius is going to expel the Jews in 49 AD. The church was not founded by Peter. He was in Jerusalem. If you read Acts, like the first 11 chapters, he's in Jerusalem uh, with the Jerusalem church. And uh, Paul didn't found this church by the evidence already given. Uh, How was it founded? It was founded by Jewish believers who got saved, I think, at Pentecost. Because what happened at Pentecost? Well, think about it. Acts chapter 2. Jews come from all around the known region. uh, And that's when the Spirit of God descends upon the church. How do you convince Thousands of Jews that Christ is the risen Lord and Savior. Well, he sends the Spirit to give people dialectic ability. To speak in a dialect that you didn't know. So just suppose that you don't know German. And you're sitting there for Pentecost. And all of a sudden you have the ability to speak German. And you're a Christian, Jew. But you're with somebody, they're German. But you don't know German. And all of a sudden you can totally speak in their dialect. Because that's the word that's used in the Greek text. Uh, He gave them the ability to speak in tongues. It's not talking about heavenly angelic language. The word's dialectos. How do you convince those Jews that Christ was the Savior and he's now in the church? Tongues was the ability to speak dialects that you didn't know. So you know, how long does it take to learn a foreign language anyway? Have you got past the coma esta usted thing? You know, Feliz Navidad, you know? Frolic of I mean, I mean, pick the language. I mean, what? I mean, I was told when I was uh, taking uh, different languages, uh, you know, you've mastered the language when you think in it. That's a lie. <laughs> I mean, I spent six years studying Greek. I don't think in Greek. I think in English. Then I got my master's in Hebrew. I don't I don't think in Hebrew, I think in English. So I I still have a long way to go. If you all of a sudden could speak fluent whatever, sign that God, the God of languages, gave you ability beyond your ability to give witness of himself. He's now in the ecclesia of the church. That convinced a lot of Jews from Rome that Jesus was the Messiah. So we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, these interesting words. Quote, uh, for Pentecost, they came from Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. What happened? They came to Pentecost. They got saved at Pentecost. They embraced Christ as the risen Lord at Pentecost. They left their Judaism behind. They embraced Jesus and they went back to Rome and began to tell their family members they got saved and they got saved and they formed a church. And eventually Paul says, I'd really like to come there and teach you people as an apostle uh, what it means to be a believer at a deeper level and what it means to follow Christ at a deeper level. That's the book of Romans. Why was he writing that book anyway? Well, he's writing that book uh, for uh, strategic purposes. When you read Corinthians, Corinthians, even 2 Corinthians, he's writing to them because it's a church with an issue. I mean, the church didn't respect Paul's authority. They're constantly downgrading him as, a, as, a, as an apostle. Uh, he has all kinds of issues with the church he founded. So he writes these letters to the Corinthians to address issues in the church. It's the same thing we like with Galatians. You know, the first chapter of Galatians is like, how can you churches in Galatia have possibly walked away from the gospel and believe another gospel? And so he's constantly writing letters like that. But Romans isn't like that. Romans is of a different nature. He's writing about doctrine and about practice for strategic purposes. Because what does he want to do? Paul wants to go to España, Spain. And he wants to use Rome as the catalyst to get to Spain. He's constantly thinking forward. He's looking forward. So he's in Corinth. He's strategizing to go to Rome. 
And then from Rome, he's strategizing to go to Spain. Uh, my mom's sister, my Aunt Roberta, who uh, died when she was 51 from uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, great woman of God. She married my Uncle Tony, uh, Antonio Sanchez, from Barcelona. Uh, I've been to Spain for one month with him. It's great going with somebody who's fluent. Uh, yeah, I, I took my Berlitz guide, just pointed, you know. You know, I need a spoon uh, right there, you know. Uh, my uncle, great, great man of God. He got saved, uh, raised, uh, you know, apart from the faith his whole life. He, he got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Yeah, and we never thought he'd be saved. And he trusted Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. Life changed forever. He was from España. See, Paul was looking to go elsewhere. You must stop and ask yourself, if I, if I view D.C. as my Corinth, and God's going to move me with the military or the government to some other location, that could be my Rome, and when I get to that Rome, I must be asking myself, God, I, what am I supposed to do here? We're supposed to preach the gospel there. And then after this Rome, then where else, God, must you send me? The, the saint that's really clued into God has a vision for constantly going with the gospel and sharing that gospel. That was Paul. So he wanted to go to Rome for strategic purposes, to take the gospel beyond Rome. So he's going to lay out the doctrinal structure of the book of, of of Romans to so talk about the, uh, the greatness of the gospel, what it's all about, and then he's going to talk about how to live for Christ so that when he gets to Rome, he can deepen their faith and then challenge them to help support him like as a missionary as he goes to Spain. You know, he also, on a, on a sub-note, answers many questions in this book. Wow, does he? I mean, well, these kinds of questions, uh, some of his other sub-purposes. Uh, can a non-Christian reason their way to God? That's going to be chapter one. Uh, what is the nature of sin? I mean, does it really have a downward spiral to greater levels? Uh, how has God given us the evidence that he exists? Do we have any evidence at all? Uh, what, are, what are we to make of uh, uh, the relationship between the, the, the gospel and the law of Moses? I mean, is there a relationship between the two? Uh, where did sin come from? You know, uh, if sin causes grace to abound, does that mean we should sin more so we get more grace? And all kinds of questions he's going to answer as we go along. Great book. But its great purpose is strategic for the gospel. And lastly, I close with a well, simple question. What's the structure of the book? Twofold. Doctrine and practice. A lot of Paul's books are put together like this. Doctrine and practice. Orthodoxy. Orthopraxy. You can't know how to behave as a Christian until you know what you're supposed to do. So he's going to spend 11 chapters uh, talking about doctrine, one doctrine. How is a man saved before a holy God? Not by works of the law. You're saved, you're justified before God's holy throne based on faith in Christ as the Savior. And then he's going to spend chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 talking about if you know Christ, then how should you live for Christ? What a great book. I'm looking forward to it. Amen. And I'm glad you're with us for the journey. So you are a minor. You have a spade. We're going to go into the cave next week. We're going to cover one verse. Your assignment is read verse one for next Sunday. <laughs> one. Uno. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you. We adore you. Thank you for the inspired word of God that has the answers and keys to life in it. And thank you for the Savior who is indeed risen and reigning on his throne today. Inspire us. Encourage us. Uh, teach us and challenge us. And may we be a different kind of people in a church as we study this great book. We ask for your anointing on it.